speaker may speak for 8 minutes for the warning bell of 6. For reply speeches, a maximum of 4 minutes is allowed for the warning bell of 3. So I'll put on the side of your family from my university. Please welcome Kyle May. Prostitution, 
ignore the merits thereof. It's a debate about sex slavery and the trafficking of women. Because we say that even those women, those women who choose to work in, who choose to work as sex workers, those women are not consenting to the fact that they're going to be um, working in illegal brothels in appalling conditions uh, and not have the visas that they were promised in the first place, not having a legitimate place in the society that was the promise that was held out to them in the first place. So then this final issue of the way in which women perhaps most greatly are, are, are punished by the system that we have in place now. Because these women are working illegally in the country, because they've been duped and they're not working under normal sort of visa requirements, they don't have regular visas, or if they have any papers at all, that matter, what happens to them when they're found out? When they're found out, ladies and gentlemen, at the moment, they're deported. They're sent back to their country. This has two very large implications for those women. Firstly, the huge stigmatisation that occurs when you get sent back to a village or a town where these kinds of things, A, was not what they were led to believe in the first place, but the kind of cultural sensitivities that come from a lot of the developing countries that these girls, very young girls in often rural areas, are sent out of. So what we say is that that's a first thing. That's a huge thing for those girls to, to, to face. And that's something that, on top of all the suffering that they've had, we just don't think you can justify in this situation. Secondly, they face a huge amount of recrimination because the people that they were duped into in the first place still operate in those countries, ladies and gentlemen. So they have no ability to speak out about what they've had to prevent other people from suffering the same fate as they had as well. And that just adds to the trauma and that just adds to the punishment. So the model that we're proposing, which allows them to stay in the country, in the developed country, is the most humane, the most moral way we can treat these people who are effectively victims of not just one crime, but three crimes under our, our, under our current system. They're punished in three particular ways. But let's look at this second issue in the debate today, and that's the legal system and how our current legal system just doesn't, it, it's not effectively dealing with the problem at hand. And the main situation we see in this is that the current people, the current victims of these crimes, they're the only ones who can help us prosecute the real criminals, the traffickers. And they have, given their irregular status, and the fact that they're going to be deported, absolutely no incentive to come forward. Absolutely no reason to stand up and give evidence. And we say that the kind of lack of situation at the moment, in, in, in the Australian context, there's been a law in place since 1996 prohibiting sex trafficking. And this year is the first year that a case has even come to trial. And we say that the reason that there's been a lack of action and the reason there's been a lack of movement in dealing with this issue is because Essentially, the Department of Justice and the prosecution have no ability to prosecute these cases because they've got no way in which to allow the, the victims of these crimes to actually have any benefit from participating in the process. So, get this second issue under the uh, under the sort of current situation, the legal situation we have, and that is we don't. Not only do we not address the illegal brothels in Australia, but we have no way of addressing the source of the problem either. Because if you send these women back to the country which they came from, then they'll face recrimination, they'll face reprisals, and there's no way in that situation that they're going to testify or even identify any of the groups from the countries that they were willing to come from. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about sex traffickers. We're not talking about nice people. We're talking about people who would happily cut people's throats to stop them from talking. Because this is a lucrative business. It is a business that makes people a lot of money. So for the fact that we can't punish these women three times, the fact that the current situation does nothing to address the problem or stop it in any way, the case must stand.
Ladies and gentlemen, at the start of this debate, we will concede one thing. It is immense suffering that women who are involved in sex trafficking go through. We're not going to deny that on our side. Yet what we are going to talk about, what we are going to recognize is, there's suffering in all forms of human trafficking. There's suffering in all forms of illegal activity that bring people across borders in very dangerous and very ominous means. And we say, what you needed to show and what they really needed to demonstrate was an exclusivity in this means that is not present in others. Because the way governments react towards human trafficking in the case of and sex trafficking is quite similar and we say for good reason. Because we recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that it is an illegal activity, that we do need to solve the problem, but we don't do it by just willy-nilly giving out residency yeah. to everyone. Because that's pretty important in today's debate. Because we concede, we will target the traffickers and we'll outline how we can do that later on. And we concede that we're also not going to detract from the suffering that they experience. But what we will emphasize on this side of the house is that this policy does more harm than good. And I'll discuss it on two levels in my case. First, it is idea of the, of the moral inconsistency that exists. Because we give, we give residency away for this case, but not others. On a second level, though, we we'll recognize the idea that it's indeed counterproductive. On, in Balloon's speech, we we'll recognize two things. Firstly, it's, sorry, one thing, this idea of alternatives, and secondly, this idea of shared responsibility. But essentially, what is the counter proposal that you're going to have from the negative today? And we're going to talk about this. We say sex traffickers are indeed bad, but we have to recognize firstly that two levels of people who are actually involved in the act of sex, tra sex trafficking. And it's not exactly divided as evenly and as cleanly as they think they are. Because the idea is that there are people who are involuntarily forced into it, and they agree. They're forced into it because they're duped, they're cheated. Or essentially, sometimes they actually apply for they apply to a proxy for real things, like student visas or worker visas, and are later, those things are later confiscated from them, and they're forced to the industry. So we recognize the fact that in that case, if a government was to catch someone involved on that level, we should obviously give them back what they took was taken away from them. The government should consider the idea that they need, if they applied for a student visa and was confiscated from them by sex traffickers, a government should give that back. But on a second level, if they were indeed brought in the same way as any other illegal immigrant or human trafficker, or a, a person that was human uh, trafficked by human traffickers was brought in, we have to recognize that they apply themselves or we apply the same process that's applied in any other immigration dispute. Recognize the idea, ladies and gentlemen, that they have to apply through normal means. That means if they satisfy the tests that are already there, they can come in, just like asylum seekers, just like human traffickers, and people who are illegal, illegal immigrants who are trafficked under status quo. Obviously, in the case of sex of people who are victims of sex trafficking, we recognize the need for access to medical facilities and also access to, to counseling. But the important question is this, and the important thing is this, that if they don't demonstrate enough um, they don't demonstrate their previous ability or previous right to be able to retain residency in an the area, they should be deported back home in there. And we also preclude, we also, we also promote ideas like international cooperation, things like joint enforcement of policies on immigration laws, things like anti-sex uh, anti trafficking laws. At the same time, we say these things all are, are, are capable of solving the problem without taking it to the extent of granting residency. Now let's examine the case that someone there said how. Firstly, they said that they're suffering, and we consider that. But what they really needed to say was demonstrate an exclusivity to suffering that is not present in any other form of trafficking, which they did not. Because quite importantly, ladies and gentlemen, people that come from Afghanistan on a boat are in danger of their lives per se, yet at the same time, we're quite willing to send them back or put them in detention camps in the middle of the desert. On a second level, ladies and gentlemen, we say this. If, there's a, if, if people come in on various other basis, we say that they can't... They, they, we say that they can't... Um, apply for immigration or permanent residency. So we recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a limit on who we allow and who we don't allow into these countries. And we need to see, we don't, we don't see a specificness that is demonstrated by the fact that people are brought into sex trafficking. Then came the second basis, that we won't be able to, we won't be able to help this women or help the problem. Now the first part on stigmatization. Now, we say this. Firstly, if the parents gave a, it, it's almost a presumption of stupidity in rural parts of, of countries that are not developed. Because what they seem to say is that people who send their kids away with the idea that they're going to have a, a going to a promised land and come back later on because they discovered that they were actually being trafficked and they were essentially sex slaves are going to send more people in that direction. And we say, no, they're not. Pretty much, ladies and gentlemen, people are going to tell other people. It's not something yeah, that's yeah, beneficial. Yeah, yeah. But on a second level, ladies and gentlemen, if you actually do keep them in countries, what you're essentially doing is encouraging the idea that it is a fundamental benefit at the end of the road. You're essentially saying, ladies and gentlemen, that despite everything that happens, essentially things will turn out fine later on. Secondly, though, we say the incentive to stop it, instead of to stop the crime, lies in the seriousness of the crime per se. You don't have to put people in a certain country. And quite obviously, ladies and gentlemen, that the cases that 
there were demonstrations of where we have solved the problem. In the cases of Britain, in the cases of quite obviously Thailand, ladies and gentlemen, which experienced extreme amount of sex trafficking from the Burmese border. So we have to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that there is exclusivity and there's an ability to fix this problem without granting the solution. So why should we not grant the solution? The first problem is this. We see a degree of moral cons inconsistency. Because there's a basis for which we grant people the right to residency. And that's demonstrably on the basis of incentive and self-interest to the nation state per se. In that case, ladies and gentlemen, it's not demonstrated here. And the reason and we say furthermore, it's inconsistent for you to rule or adjudicate that some some reasons for coming into a country and getting automatic or de facto residency are all right, but others are not. Because who are you to come out here and say that the suffering of people in Indonesia in terms of being below the poverty line and not having not having basic needs met is no less is, is much less or much less, con or much less consideration than that of someone who's born by sex trafficking. Because it seems almost, ladies and gentlemen, that they say that there's a further importance here because these women suffer. But we say a lot of people are experiencing suffering throughout the world, but we don't immediately make that a prerequisite. Particularly in the case of even asylum, where we turn people down, even though they have, they have the option to turn people down, even though they're in danger of political discrimination or political suffering or the possibility of death from their own nations that they came from. Yet we can quite possibly send them back, which Britain has done on many occasions in the case of Algerians. On a second level though, ladies and gentlemen, we say it's counterproductive because it firstly does one thing, it softens the risk. What it essentially does, ladies and gentlemen, is makes this business more lucrative to the sex traffickers or snakes hit them, snake hits themselves. Because essentially, ladies and gentlemen, what you're encouraging here, or what you're putting here, is an idea that the value or the, the, the power of the idea that someone is in, in, um, in sex trafficking is the idea that there's so much pain involved. And to the extent, ladies and gentlemen, that, we move, that, that if you make it a business that is essentially something that um, has uh, the ability to recuperate an individual later on. You open it firstly to this idea of individuals exploiting the situation to gain access to countries, because just like, uh, and this is quite exemplified in the idea of Netherlands, where it is not sex trafficking that brings about most of the prostitutes that we see in East, um, from in, 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 the, in Netherlands, but rather Eastern European immigrants who come over to, to take advantage of the fact that it's economic viable solution of making money. And we see that so, same sort of demonstration and the same sort of abuse can occur in this situa situation. On a second level, Though, we say it shifts the focus from a preventive measure of attacking sex trafficking towards a measure where we actually try to deal with the symptoms of it or deal with the harms of it. Because you have to recognize that the idea behind sex trafficking and the way to deal with the problem is to not go, is not to take people who have been harmed by it and give them more than they necessarily need. Because we give them what they need when we send them back and we take care of them in that aspect. What we have to recognize is the idea is starting the snake hits, the sex neck the sex traffickers themselves, and make sure that we have harder penalties on them. Make sure that we have the ability to detect them. The same way that we stop anyone else who traffics humans across borders. Because we recognize in them that that is essentially a crime. People who are trafficked in human trafficking also end up working in subpar slavery conditions. Yet at the same time, we don't say that we have to make them citizens or residents. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we, de we have to de we demonstrate it on our side of the house that the problem is not tied in necessarily to the idea of suffering. That furthermore, suffering is not necessarily something that occurs on one basis, but it's something that occurs in many levels of trafficking. And we're saying for the sake of consistency and for the sake of solving this problem, we beg to oppose.
brave man, because not only does he want to solve the problem of sex trafficking, which is noble, but he actually wants you to believe that we're doing it right now. That the status quo along those bastions of border security nations, Thailand and Burma, is that they're effectively fighting the good fight. And you know, by and large, they're winning. He doesn't really want to change that model terribly much, so I guess it must be working pretty well for him. No, that's garbage. The reason why we're having this debate is because the problem of sex trafficking is not just horrific in the way that Kylie described it, and was kind of conceded by them, and I'll go into why their concession is pretty damaging to them, but it's an exploding problem. It's not something that's slightly getting better or kind of staying stable. It's a problem that's expanding rapidly. Australia is facing an increasing problem of this. Developed nations around the world, as well as some developing nations, facing an increasing issue of cross-border trading views specifically for the sex trade because it's seen as being a weaker link in the, in the cross-border transnational crime law enforcement mechanisms. So, first thing I want to do is this idea of exclusivity. Then I want to look at the effectiveness of what we're proposing before I go on to look at the domestic and regional implications of our model. The first thing is I say, we haven't shown mutual exclusivity. You know what, being trafficked to be a sex worker, it ain't that different really to just that usual kind of, I can't be bothered getting a visa or I want to skip through the refugee system and coming in. You know what, that's just ridiculous. Okay, sure, they both came over on boats and we both said, that's bad, that's the first part of the process, that's bad. But then when you come to this country or any other developed nation and you're illegally abusing the migration system, you land on a beach, you get picked up by immigration, you apply for asylum. Now, in this country, applying for asylum means staying out in the desert in bad facilities. You know what? We think that's wrong. I'm going to talk about that later. But more importantly, that's nothing like being chained to a radiator in an underground brothel to be effectively raped ten times a day, six days a week, for years on end. If he thinks that's even comparable, then he's insane. But you know what? Even if he's right, okay, even if they are the same, human trafficking is wrong in any instance, and we're opposed to them all. But the problem we face with sex trafficking is that it's much larger and more damaging, and more importantly, it's much harder to fight than normal human trafficking because you can't get these women to come forward and give evidence of what has happened to them because they're afraid of being sent home and either being stigmatised and or murdered by the groups who traffic them in the first place. Because unlike what these guys have you believe, these women don't go home and tell their brave stories because the people who did this to them are still operating in those villages and rural areas and places like China. And they're not going to let these women come home and say to young girls, you know what, if that guy over there tells you he can get you a job as a nanny in Australia, he's lying, because you'd be dead if you did that. So when these women go home, they very quickly become silenced. And not only do the countries like Australia lose the ability to gain evidence against these groups and start to attack those criminal networks at their core, but those women go home to be oppressed in an, in an even more horrendous way than probably what they faced already in the first place, because they now have to be silent about what's happened to them. And then they tell us, well, the problem with this model is it doesn't allow the government to limit access to who's coming into our country. Because it's a soft touch. Because what we want to do is we said, let these women come in, and then because we're not going to charge them anymore for crimes against their visas, we're going to use them to testify. And that's going to be a soft option, right? People are just going to slide into the country. You know what? Firstly, even if that was true, we think protecting women who have gone through this process is worth it. But the bottom line is that our model is about generating the evidence necessary to fight back against these groups, which isn't what's happening right now. And if our plan works by suggest and it's for them to prove that it doesn't, you'll actually see a decrease in the level of trafficking. Not that more women are coming in, but as we break the networks that conduct this trafficking, there will be less opportunity for women to be duped in this most horrific of ways. And uh, so that leads me on to what I want to talk about, about domestic and regional cooperation and the impacts we're going to have in this model. Firstly, domestically, it's funny they talk about the way countries like Australia treat human um, trafficking in other ways, because on this side of the house, I think human trafficking is wrong and we want to deal with it, but the way in which it's being undervalued in this country is because because of things like our refugee policies, which have allowed the government to effectively demonise illegals and aliens as valueless people who you should have no sympathy for. And that's largely stuck in this country, unfortunately, and many others, like the UK, where border protection policies are getting harder and harder and harder. And we're never going to be able to redress that trend if we don't start looking at the most extreme, the most damaging example of what this trafficking can do and say, that's not good enough. It's impossible for us to treat these people as anything other than victims and not criminals as these people would have you believe, oh, except the two or three that had a student visa, they're going to be nice to them. <coughs> the rest are going to be sent home to be treated like meat again. We say the problem is if you want to deal with issues like human trafficking in nations like Australia, we have to start by fundamentally undermining the, the alienation and demonisation programs that this government's embarked on over the last eight years. And we're not going to do that by entrenching it, by saying those people who came over on a boat, they're bad. Those people who came over on a boat and were raped, 
they're just as bad, that's not going to work and that's not going to lead to the kind of changes that we need. But more importantly, those kinds of processes not, are not only domestically bad, not only are negative in the way in which Australians learn to treat migrants, whether they're legal or not, they're tarred with the same level of suspicion equally that people who came from other countries are just coming here to abuse your system. That's bad enough as it is. But further, it alienates Australia politically from nations in the region who it needs to support its fight against human trafficking. I'd like to know how they think Australia is going to fight normal human trafficking when the number one source of that trafficking is Indonesia, which is a nation that doesn't even have people smuggling as a criminal offence because it fundamentally is opposed to what Australia's policies are on refugees and doesn't want to be a party to that by being seen as being part of Australia's regional program to fight people tra trafficking. If Australia takes a more humane approach, an approach that can be recognised and respected by the region, they will have a much greater chance of generating cooperation on those kind of issues that they want to talk about too and the ones that we're concerned about today. So that leads me on to talk about regional cooperation. Because Australia doesn't want to just address the issue of people smuggling, because funnily enough, what we're realising now, thanks to several conferences held and um, hosted by Australia and around the region, like one recently in Jakarta, is that transnational criminal networks and other uh, undesirable groups, as we'll call them, like criminal groups and terrorists, operate through similar networks. Because funnily enough, if you can smuggle in 50 Chinese women from a rural area and sneak them past customs, you can smuggle in lots of other things, lots of other people who you don't want the government to be aware of. So those networks often have an incentive to cooperate, they often overlap in the, in the activities that they conduct. And so fighting against one part of that network can help you to unravel other more complex parts of that network. It's not a shock to anyone that the same kind of groups that deal in drugs are also the same kind of groups that import illegal weapons because they use the same mechanisms of subterfuge and of bribery and corruption to infiltrate through border security measures. But those are incredibly difficult crimes to fight. It's immensely difficult to fight back against these criminal networks because they have access to human humongous amounts of money and power and they're entrenched. But this new issue of, of sex discrimination and sex trafficking, which isn't new in the sense it's never been done before, but it's new in the sense that the scale that's operating on now is unprecedented, that's largely the weak link in those transnational chains because there are people who are victims who will speak out if only we would let them in this country and not punish them for wanting to help us help ourselves. So if Australia wants to fight these networks within the region that do all of the things they're concerned about as well as what we're focused on in this debate, then they need to look at the weakest links in those criminal network chains and that's the women who are largely uneducated, who are largely duped and illiterate and give them the protection they need to come forward. Because we think largely if you've been the victim of sex trafficking, you really want to see these people get punished but you don't want to be sent home and you don't want to have your throat cut because as Carly said, you've already been through two forms of punishment, you've already been smuggled in under great fear of your life and then treated in, under the most inhumane conditions imaginable, you don't want to compound that by being sent home to be stigmatised and to be intimidated so they keep their mouths shut. But this is the weak link, this is where we can fight them. So in terms of exclusivity, we think they're not terribly exclusive in the sense that we can fight them all simultaneously under this model anyway, but they are exclusive in the sense that we're targeting this specific group with immunities and with protections because they're the weak link in the chain, they're the most horrific link in the chain, we need to deal, we need to start with the process there so we can expand and do some good for us instead of being the usual shameful country that we are. We beg to propose. Back in my indoor Bangkok, MFU made its first appearance in the finals. And 
a good friend of mine, Bill, said something, and I give me a great honor to say it back again this time around. MMU has arrived, and with us, Mr. Speaker, this time around, we have brought the entire Asian along with us. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to your first truly Austral Asian debating finals, Mr. Speaker. Per se, Mr. Speaker. But so let's look at a few things the affirmative side chose to talk about. Because never in the speech did they tend to the idea that this would provide to be a deterrent to new women coming to Australia. What they have decided to do is to provide protection for the women currently in Australia or in any other country that's already involved in this trade. And we will argue further that it's an inconsistent government policy. And secondly, the better ways to do it, Mr. Speaker. But let's look at a few things that's come out. First, this lame idea that it's harder to investigate if you deport them. No. Any legal student here or anyone with some common sense who knew, will know that if you have a trial proceeding in a certain country, you will detain the person, the witness, the accused, the plaintiff, everyone involved till the trial is over, Mr. Speaker. So in this case, we think the women would still remain in that particular country till the trial is over, Mr. Speaker, and they would not be immediately de be departed or de sorry, deported if there is a court case pending. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, even in case of investigation, you can hold them till you uh, till you're pleased with the investigation before you deport them, Mr. Speaker. And also, what this indicates is the lack of cooperation that exists between the two countries. If you come up here and say that if you send people back, if you send these victims back, then we cannot have any recourse or any way of knowing who were involved or who were the cause of this tragedy. And if that is the cause, Mr. Speaker, then what we should be working towards is the idea of more cooperation yeah, yeah, yeah. and not this, Mr. Speaker. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, he came up here and showed status quo is bad. But it's not enough for you, Tim, to come up here and say status quo is bad. What you have to do in your speech is to show extensively why your proposal is good. And you see, thus, this part, yeah, yeah, yeah. there hasn't been a lot of substantiation on that part. And the major thing that's coming on this side is the idea of protecting women, Mr. Speaker. And he, he says this, the proposal attempts to protect women who are already involved. And Tate spoke about how the fact that it's inconsistent and how support, support systems exist otherwise. We will provide them with therapy, we will provide them with uh, counselling. We even communicate with the country where these ladies, uh, women origi originate from. And we have support structures there, Mr. Speaker. And it does not in any way show how we can protect new women from being involved in this trade. Because they elaborately spoke about the idea of how this doesn't prove any deterrent. In fact, at certain times, it, may, it creates this belief that it's better off if you go to Australia, Mr. Speaker, or yeah. any other country that provides you automatic residential, because you'll probably be better off there. And this second idea, Mr. Speaker, is the idea of sending women back to hell. And we say, on an emotive level, that's not quite true. If a woman was a woman was involved in a sex trade in a particular country, then I would really reckon that sending her back to origin country is probably better off. Because it would be traumatizing for that person to continue living in the place yeah, where yeah. she was brutally raped, where she was brutally violated, Mr. Speaker. Visiting the same places where you were traded off would only hurt them even more compared to the place of your origin where you can get solace not only from your family but your relatives and your community, Mr. Speaker, who would sympathize on you and not prosecute you, prosecute you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And then his final thing is the idea of uh, Indonesia and the idea of how some countries do not have policies on smuggling. And firstly, I say that's not true, Mr. Speaker. And secondly, even if that's not true, what would stop every other Indonesian woman and men crossing borders into Australia or any other country in hopes of getting an automatic yeah, residential, yeah. Mr. Speaker? They haven't handled that. In fact, if that's a problem with status quo, then what you have to do is to go towards the direction of creating more cooperation with Indonesia, putting more pressure on their political pressure and moral pressure, Mr. Speaker. And that's something I'll be handling in my speech. Now, going to my speech, Mr. Speaker, firstly, I'm going to look at the idea of shared responsibility and secondly, the alternatives. Firstly, shared responsibility. Firstly, by having this proposal, what you are indeed creating is a perception that the government is indeed liable for the sex trade that happens in this country. And we realize that it's inconsistent with government liability. A government is liable, firstly, for the legislation that it legislates and could regulating the uh, legislation, Mr. Speaker. We realize that in cases of drug abuse, 
Yes, there are legislations that say that you can't abuse drugs, you can't smuggle drugs. So the government is responsible for ensuring that happens. But if someone violates this, then what we do is we capture the people, we arrest the people and make sure these people get a fair trial. And that's the government responsibility. The government does not have to does not have to be responsible for taking care of the people who were involved in this trade. It, I, and it is, this is consistent with other parts like even human trafficking and in also cases of people who have suffered, suffered drug abuse, Mr. Speaker. We do not do that. We only provide what is necessary. In this case, we think we, we've been caring enough in showing that these people can get what they lost when they came to these particular countries and we think that is enough, Mr. Speaker. And secondly, Mr. Speaker, let me ask you, why do we punish the target countries and not the source countries? Why is it that the target countries alone have to do this and not the source countries? Because it's a two-way thing. Human traf sex, se uh, trafficking, uh, sex trafficking happens on two levels. Firstly, a source nation has been involved in it because this country probably they've ignored the fact that a sex trade exists there and that's why you really move and that's why they do not clamp down on it. On a second level, it's a country that is targeted. But when you put all the owners on this country to stop the sex activity, we see that it's a futile effort because we don't think it will go far. Yeah. Secondly, this effect, this proposal actually goes back. It's not a good thing, it's counterproductive because it doesn't deter people from coming into the country, it only promotes them from com coming to the country, Mr. Speaker. That's why we think responsibility should be shared and how do we do it? When, and that's where I go to my second point, the idea of alternative speaker. And there's two ways of doing this. We firstly need to create awareness and secondly we, start, we, we need to start regulating the industry, Mr. Speaker. First thing, the idea of creating awareness. We realize now a lot of countries, especially target countries and source, uh, source countries, do not have adequate information sharing between these countries. And like, the current situation is this. A target nation, like Tim said, are trying to tighten border controls and have harsher Im immigration laws. But that's not, it's not effective because it's a reactive measure and not a pro proactive one. Like I showed you the idea of Indonesia, if how we do not have the cooperation of a source country, we will not stop the flow or reduce the influx of people coming to the country, but rather it, it, it will probably increase it. And this proposal really increases it because it doesn't work as a deterrent, but rather more of a promotion, Mr. Speaker, and that they, that's why we think it's bad, because this proposal aggravates the flow. And secondly, Mr. Speaker, when it's also the, the idea that the source nations are indifferent to the situation. Like a lot of prostitutes that come from the third world country come uh, from a, na a government where they are hugely indifferent to the problem. You see in cases, Mr. Speaker, although there are full arrests on sex traffickers, a lot of governments tend to be indifferent towards this issue because they realize if you admit that there is a problem, then you're saying that there is a big problem and it will affect the government's approach and their stance, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we think if you cooperate with this government and tell them that no, it's not only about me taking the responsibility, but what we're going to do is have diplomatic ties, push it further, and we're going to make sure it's harsher on that. It will actually help this country, or rather make them be less indifferent towards the situation, Mr. Speaker. And this is not mutually exclusive, Mr. Speaker, because by having that proposal, you only make these things bad and not equal. And that's why we think the proposal must fall, Mr. Speaker. With that, I press my case. Thank you.
Thank you, members of this most august house. We've been asking questions today by our opposition. Why are women different? If they're not, what does it matter? To what extent does this regulatory fra framework work? And how will theirs work, given that it's really just the status quo with more good information sharing? And we say what they fail to understand is that, first of all, women are completely different in this particular issue. But secondly, that our current process is hampering the thing they most want to do. Us taking this initiative will, in fact, strengthen regional ties, strengthen diplomacy, and strengthen Australia's interest in the region. So let's first of all look at why women are different. It's not, they're not different in the sense that they experience trafficking worse, although they may, in a lot of instances, they may be subject to greater violence and more degradation. Uh, degradation. But everyone suffers traffic, and we agree on that, and that's horrible. They suffer that, plus they suffer sexual slavery. Plus they suffer, through deportation, things that other refugees, or alleged refugees, don't suffer. They suffer a risk of death through these cartels recriminating them when they get home. And also they suffer a massive stigmatisation, which just does not exist to the same extent as other people sent home from Australia. Because they are seen as tainted by the work they've done in Australia through no fault of their own. Now our system acknowledges that help. Our system doesn't punish the victim, and our system tries to strengthen the way we can uh, help the victim and ameliorate the problem by giving them some sense of immunity, giving them some sense of future, and by using them for the evidence that we need to build working cases. Their system just says, well, look, everyone suffers at it, so that's good enough. And we say, not everyone does suffer it. And the second reason why not everyone suffers it is that the market imperative in sexual trafficking is completely different to the general people sm uh, smuggling market imperative. Because this is the biggest return on investment in the people trafficking game. Yeah, yeah. As a result, there is a massively burgeoning market which they protect ruthlessly with incredible violence. And as a result, we have a spiral of this sort of thing. This is a crisis amongst the problem of trafficking people. Now, our system fights this because it gathers evidence to mount cases that can attack the system as a whole. It doesn't just catch what are effectively the mules of this situation, the people who are the, the meaningful dupes who, who don't know what's going on, but the people who, who quite cruelly and ruthlessly exploit that innocence. And if we don't punish them twice, but they say everything is working. We say not good enough. And thirdly, the idea that, well, women have the same rights as others. And we say, sure, no one's trying to derogate from the rights of women. However, what they fail to understand is where there's an issue that specifically and disproportionately affects women, they have different rights on top of those rights that everyone else has. They have different rights to protection because they are differently vulnerable. Because they are seen as differently vulnerable in the sense that they can trade sex for whatever, whereas that wouldn't occur in the same situation for the rest of the uh, refugee community. And as a result, you need to redress that because sometimes equal tr treatment is in fact entrenching that discrimination and entrenching that disadvantage. And we say that that's grotesque because if you want to say the law is blind, that we should treat all people equally, you just don't know the realities of these sorts of situations. And this is indicated by the way they say people will see coming to Australia as a, this is a simple way in. As though sexual slavery is an easy pass. As though it's a soft option to say you just don't understand and you haven't come to grips with how horrible it is. Because if you did, you'd never say that. But even if they are the same, you know, even if they don't have different rights, we say, well, the policy of demonising refugees is wrong per se, and that this is a fundamental part of that. And deporting them is a manifestation of that. Why? Well, because in principle, as we've shown through Kylie, it's monstrous. It ignores a basic humanitarianism that we have obligations under international law and moral obligations as a civilised nation. And that, moreover, it's morally important to, under any legal system, continually punish the victim. And they've never really come up with a way that their system won't continually punish the victim. They've just said they'll be fine. Next, the idea that it undermines regional links. Because Australia is, and this is what Tim said, most capable of taking these refugees in this region. Australia is the one most easy to bear this, and we wouldn't call it burden, but to bear this extra number. Australia is the one that is most capable of doing it, and taking a hardline policy means that countries like Indonesia, whose support we need, and that we all agree we need, won't enact complementary laws to Australia because it won't, it doesn't assist them because we're not doing our part, so why should they? And we say, not good enough. And they say, well this punishes Australia, because why should we have to bear more of the burden? First of all, because we can. But secondly, because it doesn't punish Australia, these women are being punished, and Australia can either watch and punish them again, or it can do something. So let's move on to the idea of how regulatory frameworks work. So we agree that they don't work perfectly, 
Uh, we're not saying they do, but what we are saying is they need to be tempted by two things. They need to be tempted by humanity and water. And they need to be tempted by the humanity of saying, our immigration policy is not defined by cherry-picking the people that we like. It's not defined by cherry-picking people who are skilled labour. That's why we have a refugee policy. That's why we say these people who may not, uh, by you know, universal economic indicators, leave utility uh, to Australia, still come to Australia because we have that obligation. And secondly, the, the regulatory framework that we want to implement needs to strengthen the court system to punish the people that we all agree are monsters. It needs to run on evidence. Now they say, well, any law student can tell you, and I am one, but Kylie told me, that <laughs> you, can, you can subpoena a witness, like a subpoena, I think it's called. <laughs> and what that means, right, is they'll stay for trial. Cool, no problem. Why would they cooperate with a system which will, as soon as that trial's finished, and exploited them, once again, punish them a fourth time, send them home, mm -hmm. to a government they admit doesn't really care about the problem? Why would they cooperate? Why would you name names in that situation? Why would you say, hmm, I can name a name and then go home to what is likely certain death and stigmatisation, or I can not and go home and just bear this in silence, which is also a horrible outcome. Or, where we know the names of these people, we can't mount the cogent case that we should be able to because they're not cooperating. And we say that we have to give them freedom from fear and we have to mount this working case against them. And they will cooperate under our system and this will work better at attacking people smuggling because they will have the safety that Australia can provide much more adequately, which they don't have when they go home. And this will minimise traffic. They say counselling. They say therapy. They say communicating with the other country. And that's super, guys. But I wonder exactly how that's going to teach them damn traffickers. I wonder what it is about that counselling that's really going to give them the ability to speak up against people who kill them. So finally the idea of their alternatives and what they're going to do, because they're saying they will send the women back to their country so they can be with their communities, so they can be with um, the people who will support them. We say, first of all, that's false in a lot of cultural contexts. But even where that is true, it won't work in the fact that it doesn't identify the perpetrators and those domestic operators who are working and continue to work successfully, in spite of the word of mouth they've told you will successfully stop them. They are working now, that's why it's a spiralling problem. And secondly, the idea that we'll have more info sharing and we'll have more cooperation, and that will somehow solve this problem. We say, well, we're having that now, we're not having enough of it because Australia isn't stepping up to its responsibilities, but also that Australia is a barrier to that, and so are other countries, the governments like Indonesia, but they say, don't care about this problem. Now, if they don't care about this problem, how could you possibly, in good conscience, suggest sending them back? How could you possibly send them somewhere where, while Australia isn't perfect, and indeed on this issue it can be quite bad, we have massive popular support for the idea of freeing these sexual slaves. We have massive popular support for redressing the imbalance and the grotesque abuse that happened to these women. I don't want to play on the idea that this is an emotional issue because they're women, they're special. But they disproportionately suffer a crime under the system as it stands. Because this system hurts women so much more, we need to protect them more. Because it hurts Australia, we need to protect them now. And because it hurts the region, we need to protect them in the future. Ours works for diplomacy, whereas theirs acts against it. For these reasons, we beg to propose. option 
of trying to work with we're going to be a prostitute, a legal prostitute in a foreign country. So what they provided to us in today's debate in no way discourages people from getting into this field and only harms women in the future. What we've argued, ladies and gentlemen, is that firstly it's inconsistent in terms of how we're drawing lines in terms of suffering. We've argued it's counterproductive because you dilute the deterrence that's currently uh, existent within the status quo. Thirdly, we said it's the wrongful placement of responsibility in terms of the government, or in terms of how the government shares responsibility. And to this, we heard Roland say nothing. And so, fourthly, we said that we should work on long term alternatives, ladies and gentlemen, long term solutions that deal with the problem at the source, that the women are getting on the boats, taking the very risky trip, only really half of them make it to get to these countries. And we say if you're promising them residency, ladies and gentlemen, you'll only get more and more people knocking on the door, and that is not something you should get into. What they've argued is that firstly there's this whole immense pain and suffering with the stigma and it's difficult to address the problem directly. What I will do is firstly I will look at the effects of this policy and secondly the reasons in which they said we should give residency and the four of those reasons and I'll give them in turn. Now the effects of this policy, ladies and gentlemen, we say quite plainly is in protecting and compensating the victims. But only people who have already suffered and gone there. In, in no way does this policy discourage new people from, from coming to the country, ladies and gentlemen. The risk of death for a better life is reduced because then you just give more people, give people a guarantee of the better life. Kylie got up and spoke about how much people are willing to risk, how parents are willing to give up their children, ladies and gentlemen, for a better life. How the whole village is not considered as such a bad thing, it's considered as a, a huge improvement in scale. If you can go to another country and start earning your money, of course, maybe they don't really, I suppose they don't, they don't fully realize the pain and suffering that you have to go through. But the, at the end of the day, the goal is to, is to live in a foreign country and to earn loads of money and send them back home. And we say, this, what, what the policy that they're proposing in the affirmative guarantees that goal. And even if even if people know that there's going to be suffering and risk involved, there is still the guarantee of that goal, ladies and gentlemen. And if anything, this encourages it. The one, yeah, even, yeah. Even, even furthermore, Kate also said, by not sending people back, you don't you don't become, you don't educate people of the of what went wrong in the country. If in, if in a village, girls start slowly moving away and gaining permanent residency in Australia, and money starts flowing in to the little village in Burma or wherever it is, ladies and gentlemen, then they're not going to know that they, they, they suffered so much to get that. All they're going to know is that my family has four new houses and a new house and we're living in a much better situation than we did before. And all this does is encourage more and more inconsiderate or, or, or wrongfully informed parents or villages or whoever it is to send their daughters away. And we say that is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. What they're doing is encouraging this problem. Like, they dilute the terms in no way. want to do to give residency is on four levels. Firstly, they say we should give residency because of the harm and the suffering. Secondly, to help with prosecution. Thirdly, because status quo sucks. And fourthly, because Australia is capable. But let's look to the first reason, ladies and gentlemen. Harm and suffering. We say firstly, as I have addressed with it, this is compensation, not protection. What you do is you dilute the deterrence. What you do is put a false state, uh, shoulder, false level of responsibility upon the host nation and on the source nation. We say secondly, ladies and gentlemen, they say well, if they go back, then they will get stigmatized. We say firstly, this policy deals with asylum seekers also, and it being very inconsistent there. Tim said he'll show the difference with asylum seekers, but he really didn't. Secondly, we said, well, that's an assumption, you know. Maybe they will want to go back home. Maybe their families will not stigmatize them. Maybe their families, wherever it is, even though they're poor and dirty, really care for them and don't want to stigmatize them, ladies and gentlemen. And we say, it's wrong for you to say that the moment they go back, they will be stigmatized by the whole village. But finally, we say, well, we didn't say they would necessarily go back. We say, look at the reasons in which they arrived in that country. If they were due, ladies and gentlemen, they could still apply for, for residency on the basis that they were due. If they, even if they weren't due, they still have a fair chance of life for residency. The thing is, you have to be consistent with all the people who arrive in the country and the yeah, status yeah. at which you are going to have residency. Because residency serves a specific purpose, ladies and gentlemen, not as a tool to compensate victims yeah, as, yeah. as horrendous yeah. as the crime yeah, yeah. may be. And that's the third thing we spoke about. It came right to start from a which has never been addressed. That you do not have a benchmark for pain and suffering, ladies and gentlemen. We said asylum seekers also run away from yeah. Illegal immigrants are also enslaved to a radiator to wash dishes, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of people, a lot of people, the children are also enslaved. And they, and they lose their freedom, they lose their strength, they, they, lose, they lose their lives, ladies and gentlemen. And they were also due. And you cannot say that one thing is better than the other, or one thing is worse than the other, ladies and gentlemen. The consistency in this case is the fact that the people came to the country in terms, in terms of on a legal basis. What you need to do is ensure no for more people are duped into thinking that they, their lives can be sold for such a small price. The second notion that they go into, ladies and gentlemen, is this notion of prosecution. On two levels, the first thing, first thing we say, there is 
no issue on time and detention. You can keep people in the country as long as you need them relevant to solve the case. And, and Roland agreed with you. What he said further was there's a complete lack of incentive for them to cooperate. We say the incentive to cooperate is the same pain and suffering that you guys spoke about. The incentive to cooperate is to ensure that no one else of yeah. their friends, from their villages, of, of members, or family members, or anybody else would go through that same pain and suffering that they went through yeah. Yeah. ladies and gentlemen. And if you say this as a then it is to be that, that type of If it is a question of, of stigma, that they, that they just feel it uncomfortable to talk about it, ladies and gentlemen, then we say residency per se doesn't automatically give it a stigma. Okay, and yeah. make people back. Say, then you have things like counseling and etc. etc. to ensure you're more comfortable with themselves. The third thing they spoke about the reason, the reason to have a residency is that status quo sucks. They said, they said water control is difficult because you have networks that are mixed with drugs, etc. And governments don't have legislation, etc. etc. We said, yes. That's the problem. <coughs> Fix that problem, Tim. You're a smart guy, you can think of something. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question that they work on. And those are the alternatives that we spoke about. If Australia is ultimately concerned, they should be putting pressure, political and moral pressure, on countries like Indonesia to have legislation in terms of people's money, yeah, to yeah. contribute to us in ensuring that people don't cross the borders illegally, ladies and gentlemen. And that's better because it works at the source, not at the end. It works before people have risked their lives to get on board and go through six years of being chained to a <laughs> Not just a short uh, solution like they did before, and that doesn't create an incentive. When you do that, when you, when you work towards legislation, when you work towards ensuring people don't make that difficult and, 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 and stupid mistake, ladies and gentlemen, of thinking they can sell their lives for, 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 for residency in a life of a better country, that's something that ends up helping people, not giving people automatic guarantees of a better life, ladies and gentlemen. And finally, Roland said this that Australia is capable to, to absorb people. Well, Australia is big, but not all of it is inhabitable. Um, <laughs> We don't think that's true. It's not just a question of size. We see asylum seekers and stuff being turned away. But even more importantly, that's not the message that you want to send to people. You don't, you don't want to send the message that if you want a better life, run away from your home, risk death and, and, and slavery and, and, and sell all the things that are considered precious and moral and valuable in your life because we can be Australia is capable and we will take you in, ladies and gentlemen. It's not a question of compensation. This is not a debate about how we give victims back the things that they've lost. Because you know what, you can never give them back the things that they've lost. Yeah. The, the, the lives that they suffered yeah. is you have to deal with it. You have to help them get over the pain and suffering. Help them build a new life. But you can never compensate fully, ladies and gentlemen. What you need to do is ensure no more people go through the same things that they went through. And we say not a single aspect of what they're proposing today leads in that direction. It dilutes the deterrence. It doesn't work at the source, ladies and gentlemen. And it, and it, and, and, you know, it just guarantees you people who are willing to risk, silly risk, risk their lives and their freedom, a guarantee of a better life. That's not the direction we want to do today. That does not protect women. We're very, very proud to work on that.
Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a side of the house on the affirmative that's pretty much sincerely wrong. They've tried to do something good and we applaud them for that. But quite essentially, they've gone around about going, gone about doing it quite the wrong way. And we'll examine <laughs> now on both sides of the house. Which side of the house stuck to its stance a bit more? Which side of the house was more prescriptive rather than descriptive with them, which gave quite largely work? And finally, which side of the house wins this debate? Now, on the side of MMU1, the negative, we demonstrated this more harm than good. And we did this on multiple levels. Now, I came up here and said it's inconsistent. I wasn't saying it's inconsistent, with them, and I didn't say it was inconsistent because it's all right to treat everyone badly. I wasn't asking for that. What I did say, ladies and gentlemen, was the fact that states don't compensate people based on the amount of suffering they did in a, or experience in a clearly illegal activity, which is quite, which is quite correct. <clears throat> because we recognize this, ladies and gentlemen, we recognize the fact that illegal immigrants, people who are victims of human trafficking, people who are seeking asylum, are not immediately on a de facto basis given a residency simply because they suffer. And that was something I demonstrated throughout my speech and was not tackled. On a second level, ladies and gentlemen, we demonstrate this idea of it being counterproductive. Because this is the problem. It does nothing to prevent a future situation of this occurring. It essentially encourages or takes care of people who have suffered. And we say, that's not really a good thing anyway. But secondly, what it essentially does is it doesn't change the situation in the source countries. Which goes nicely to Balloon's first argument. Because Balloon's talked about this. He said, essentially what you're doing here is treating people who have suffered fine. But you only ensure more and more people suffer. All you do, ladies and gentlemen, is that you say to people that there is finally a pot of gold at the end of all this suffering. You're essentially saying that there is a way out that is very nice for people. And we say that sort of thing leads to the miseducation that you see in villages. On a further level, we demonstrate alternatives that exist. Alternatives that can operate in a practical way in solving this problem. But let's examine their side of the house. Now, basically what they did was they proposed a case under the need to protect women. But we see it as a very stopgate measure, very descriptive case. It was essentially a large degree of their substantive focused on describing the problem rather than talking about how their measure would solve the problem. Which we say is all well and good, but we said the problem is large. But you need to tell us how it's solved. Because the first argument they had was this argue, argument of compensation. They said, everyone wants to stay in Australia, guys, after they've been suff they suffered there. And we pointed out, that's not necessarily true. Particularly if you're in New South Wales and you can't get much alcohol. <laughs> well, the second argument they said, we say, there's fundamentally a problem there because you never really change anything back home. And that was a, a, a particularly acute problem or problem on their side of the house. Because essentially they're saying that if someone suffered enough, the state can adjudicate what they can give to people as compensation after so much suffering. And all we will give them is residency and hope things are fine. You're not really going back to the countries where the problem is. You're not really solving the problem at its root. The countries that choose to allow this, problem, this issue to go further on. On a second level, they talked about this idea we'll be, we'll be more able to prosecute sex traffickers. And we say, no, you're actually quite able to set, prosecute them under the status quo. You can detain people who are, who are illegal immigrants, in, uh, people who are going to be deported, under the basis of trying, using them for evidence in a trial. And we say, you quite aptly said in your case, guys, that essentially they would want to do this because of the harm they've suffered. Because essentially they've been hurt so much by these people and we don't see a reason why they should not. Except for the last reason, uh, last reason of this idea of regional ties. And we thought this was Tim having an excuse to talk about something that was related to his degree. Because essentially, ladies and gentlemen, said this, there's no policy on immigration. How does this create one? How does this create a policy on immigration that Indonesia would espouse and embrace? It would not. On a second level, they say it's a cooperative crime. And again, we said these things are solvable through criminal justice systems, through the fact that we have better enforcement. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to come up here and talk to people or propose a solution to a problem that involves the exploitation of women through sex trafficking, you don't propose it through giving compensation to women. You solve the problems that related to the that put the situation there in the first place. We've demonstrated that your policy exacerbates that situation yeah. and it doesn't make it any better. For those reasons, ladies and gentlemen, MMU1 is still proud to oppose.
patiently as the last two speakers describe <laughs> residency in Australia as compensation for being a sex slave. Well, I didn't think that in Australia was that good really, but it's not compensation for much. What we've told you in this debate is that giving people residency is not about compensation. We're not effectively giving these people money to make them forget. Residency is a necessary part of achieving justice and protection for a horrific crime. It's not a payoff, it's not a bribe, it's about justice. And we've said this right from the start. So let's go back to the start and let me tell you how this debate's progressed. The first issue was a description of the nature of the problem and an understanding of the magnitude and complexity of it. Secondly, we told you about how we can help women who have been trafficked now and who are currently working as sex slaves in this country. And then finally, contrary to popular belief, we have demonstrated a mechanism of deterrence by showing you how our model works in the long term to break down the criminal networks which facilitate the trade, thereby making it largely impossible for these women who are apparently going to sign up for a six-week tour of being a sex slave so you can get a visa, which is garbage, but I'll get to that. First issue, the nature of the problem, and why it's the most important place to start. This is to deal specifically with their idea of exclusivity, which has pretty much dropped, because they've recognised that this is the worst edge of the human trafficking wave. This is at its most extremely horrific, this is at its most extremely exploitative, and, luckily, this is at its most extremely weak. This is where there could potentially be large numbers of women who could act as witnesses and provide information that would allow countries like Australia to gather evidence against not just the people who run their brothels, who they probably catch at the time they catch these women, but the people who traffic them in the first place. And we've told you that this is, this is particularly bad because they suffer in three ways. They suffer the same amount, largely, that normal people smuggling um, victims suffer. But then they suffer degradation of sexual servitude. And it's laughable for these people to say that some villages and families might consider it a valid way to make money. Hello, they're called sex slaves not sex workers, they don't get wages, they're bonded slaves. We told you at the start, Kyla spent a lot of time on this, that they're forced to work off $50,000 debts. They're not earning 50k a year, they're paying 50k back. They don't make money to send back to their families, they're chained up and raped for nothing. That's what being a slave means, and to pretend like it's some kind of legitimate first world, third world trade is insane and offensive. The second issue here is how we can help these women who have been trafficked today. And rule number one is to recognise that they're victims. Not victims who need compensation, but victims who need justice. And that the largest mechanism that's barring them from getting that justice is their fear of coming forward. Because they know that if they do, all that happens is they get sent home. And we've had the, uh, the absolute assertion that if you came over here as a sex worker and were trafficked illegally, you could just apply for asylum. No, you violated your visa if you had one at all, and you get sent home. That was the premise of this debate that Kylie set up and was agreed to by Tate until about six minutes ago. So we told you that that's necessary to protect them from being sent home to places where if they speak, they will be victimised and suffer recrimination. Now, we're not going to lock them in Australia. If there are women who want to speak out and go home, Whoa, we'll send them home. But we think a large number of them would like to be able to stay and be accorded the protection of a country like Australia so they're not being sent back to the same vulnerable place where they were exploited in the first place. So finally, as a issue of deterrence, how are we going to fight these networks in the long run and see that less women are entering into this trade? And we say it's about breaking the networks. It's not like you can just have a tough love policy, because apparently for them, we have to take this tough line, because we need to treat these women not like victims but like criminals, to send a message, a message to women who'll never hear it, because that's going to somehow limit sex trafficking. Garbage. We told you again, these are some very vulnerable, often very young women. They're not, uh, they're not being recruited by Hudson Recruitment down at their local you know, y YWA. They're getting recruited from rural villages who are exploiting their ignorance of the system. You can't use a tough love message system when they're not hearing the message. All you can do is gather evidence to fight the networks. So we've shown you we understand the problem. We've shown you can help the women who are here today, and we've got to hope we can help women from coming here in the future. We beg to propose. Yeah.
break for 10 minutes while the adjudicators come to a decision. Uh, I'll meet you afterwards when we begin the other closing ceremony. Please wait until the adjudicators leave before you move on.